Our story starts up back in December and winter is coming. Change is everywhere. And really pay close attention to the word change because it's the magic thread that'll bind our three main players. Ainakoji was excited about snow. He's never experienced it in real life. Right now he was hanging out with the Ainakoji group and they were close. They hung out all the time, but you could always come and go as you'd like. Our boy enjoyed that convenience. Although the group was casual, the conversation was not. Today they were discussing Classy and what went on in volume six. Why was no one expelled from either class. They couldn't figure it out, but we know exactly why. During Paper Shuffle, Ainakoji and Ruin made a secret deal. Sakura was happy no one got expelled, but the other members weren't as kind. They knew in reality, in order to get to class A, you had to beat others down. It's a zero sum game. But Sakura was hopeful, bringing up an interesting scenario. What if at graduation, all four classes were tied in points? Could everyone graduate from class A? Oh, that's adorable. Yukimura, on the other hand, burst her happy little bubble. This scenario had a specific rule. They'll have one last special exam to determine who's class A. Listen, I don't believe in foreshadowing, but if that's how the series ends, you heard it here first, folks. Miyaki joined them after club activities and Haruka asked him how it went, but Miyaki knew she wasn't interested in archery. Still, Haruka persisted for the sake of conversation. Haruka asked why was he interested in archery. He explained a senior got him into the hobby and that's that. And I mean, look, the dude's humble, but he's got talent. If you read his info, he's won real competitions. And this this conversation led them to naturally talk about Sakura's hobbies, which was taking photos. What's that? You don't remember Sakura having this hobby? Well, yeah, we haven't seen it since like volume two. They thought Sakura liked taking photos because it's popular, completely oblivious to the fact that she used to be a model. The group even mentioned posting on Instagram. Yeah, that's actually in the novel. How trendy. However, Yukimura didn't get the appeal of posting photos online. In fact, the entire Ainakoji group was full of loners, so no one vibed with it. Haruka made a joke about Ainakoji Koji leading a double life where he partied and posted cute pics on the gram, but our boy denied it. Ainakoji liked taking photos, but they were more of the blackmail variety. But everyone dunking on Sakura's hobby didn't make her feel great. Our boy noticed this and said there was nothing wrong with people posting pics online. This gave everyone a clue and they all apologized. However, the conversation then took a quick turn. Miyaki was troubled. Recently, Class C was weird more so than usual. The Ainakoji group felt like they were followed everywhere. Our boy noticed even now someone was watching them. They also showed up to Miyaki's archery club. Ainakoji knew what this meant. Ruin was looking for X and he's narrowed his suspects. And for a fact, he marked K. She was the closest link to the mastermind. The Ainakoji group speculated all this weirdness was because Ruin was shocked, which made sense because starting the new semester, Class D would become Class C. Why? Well, Class D stole 100 points from them during paper shuffle. And mysteriously, Class C also lost another 100 points due to a rule violation. I'll reveal the details to how at the end of this volume. But it begs the question, how did Class D go so far? How did they overcome such a huge disadvantage? From the Ainakoji group's perspective, Class C was self-destructing. They completely ignored their class points during the island exam and lost again in volume six. Combine that with the recent 100 point deduction, it looked like Ruin was just throwing away points. However, Ainakoji knew that wasn't the case. Ruin made a deal with Katsuragi in volume three, that's why he lost all his points. Ruin could care less about trust or goodwill, those things meant nothing to him. He 100% and got something tangible from the trade. The girls brought up the island exam and how hectic it was. Sakura blushed saying it was almost that time of the month and your man Yukimura had the balls to actually ask what they meant. Haruka got angry telling him to get a clue. For all the reading Yukimura does, I guess he never picked up a biology book. Miyaki tapped him on the shoulder telling him to just let it go. But more importantly, they gave the credit for those wins to Horikita. This was great. Ainakoji's cover is working. So he just agreed with them. Still, the group was curious as to how everything went down. Naturally, since Ainakoji and Horikita were close, they wanted him to explain. So he told them everything about how Ruin used a radio to communicate, how Ibuki was a spy. He even went into the Zodiac exam. Of course, he took himself out of the story, mentioned none of the secret events, and made it look like all of Horikita's accomplishments. And they were sold. Horikita is the MVP. But then why was Ruin poking around? Why was he looking for a mastermind? It was obvious Horikita did it all. Ainakoji saw this as a chance to spread another rumor. By saying Horikita is so good, maybe he's trying to find her weakness. Haruka teased our boy saying, oh, his girlfriend is so capable. Ainakoji denied it, but surprisingly, Sakura jumped in as well. Haruka knew Sakura was head over heels for our boy. It was 
painfully obvious. And to be fair, Haruka wanted to help Sakura. If Sakura wanted to date Ainakoji, she needed to know whether or not he had a girl. But no matter how many times Haruka asked, Ainakoji denied his relationship with Horikita. The group talked about Christmas and how all of them would be lonely this year, and following that, decide to grab some dinner. But Ainakoji told him to go on ahead. He had something to take care of. You see, Class C weren't the only spies. There was someone else. So Ainakoji casually sat down beside the girl who watched him. It was Masumi from Class A. And it makes sense, in Volume 6, Arisu told her to spy on Ainakoji. She panicked and the tensions were high. Ainakoji asked why was she following him. Masumi denied it, but Ainakoji had detailed proof. She was like a deer caught in the headlights. Masumi went to Plan B asking, so what? At this school, following someone isn't a crime as long as you make it look coincidental. Ainakoji didn't care that she was following him. He confronted Masumi for a different reason. Ainakoji got down to his plan, threatening her, asking what would happen if he told Arisu that Masumi couldn't spy on him properly. Masumi tried to play it cool, but Ainakoji knew he had her. Our boy wanted to know how Arisu was controlling her. He asked if they were close, and Masumi, like a total idiot, told him that she hated her. Okay, so maybe Arisu had something on her. Ainakoji asked then why follow Arisu's orders. Masumi did not say a word, not realizing that that in itself is an answer. If she can't say anything, Arisu's leverage is powerful. Ainakoji probed further, asking if Arisu had something on her. Again, Masumi wouldn't say a word. Ainakoji turned up the heat, saying if she doesn't talk, he'll tell Arisu. Masumi was like, what, now you're gonna threaten me too? Read like a book. Ainakoji's speculations were all true. However, Masumi didn't come empty-handed. She thought long and hard about why Arisu would have her tail a normie like Ainakoji. Then she heard the rumor of Ruin looking for a mastermind within Class D. Wasn't hard to figure out that Ainakoji was that mastermind. Using that information, she threatened him back. She could easily volunteer the fact that he's the mastermind to Ruin. In response, Ainakoji offered her a deal. She's free to spy on him all she likes, report whatever she wants. But in exchange, she only shares that information with Arisu, no one else. Masumi accepted she gained nothing from helping Ruin. And with that, Masumi left. Ainakoji counted his good fortune. He kept someone unrelated from exposing his secret to Ruin. This will be important later. Forward to the next day, Sudo was pissed. Question, is this guy ever not angry? Class C was following him too. Horikita asked if he did anything stupid, but nah, he kept his cool. Ainakoji and Horikita talked about Sudo's growth. Looks like Horikita had some next steps planned for him, but she wouldn't tell our boy what. Ainakoji noticed recently Horikita has been acting on her own. Following the events of Volume 6, beating Ruin gave her confidence. Ruin attacked her the same way over and over again. She was bound to catch on. Kushida being a traitor played to her advantage. She knew Ruin's attacks would come through Kushida. Kushida gave Ruin a false sense of security, which Horikita exploited. Ainakoji and Horikita talked about Ruin. The whole surveillance thing wasn't weird. Ruin's known to attack even when there are no exams, such as the events back in Volume 2. Horikita analyzed Ruin's movements. It seemed like he was bored of her. So naturally, he was looking for the shadowy leader of Class D, aka Ainakoji. But Horikita wondered why wasn't anyone in Class C expelled? Her plan worked. There should be at least one or two expulsions. She had no idea Ainakoji figured out her entire plan and used that information to barter a deal behind the scene and royally screw over Kushida. But he didn't want Horikita to catch on. So he made up an explanation saying maybe smart students inside Class C stepped up. Horikita with no other explanation bought it. Our boy acknowledged Horikita's potential but she needed time. If she could get her communication skills to the level of Hirata's, she'd be a force. Changing up the topic, Horikita asked Ainakoji if he had a plan because Ruin was coming after him. There is no way he's telling her anything so he's like nah. Horikita didn't believe him but didn't have a choice either. Not getting anything, she asked him about his new friend group. Why does he hang out with them? The exam is over. Ainakoji was frank. He liked them. It was lunchtime and Horikita had a proposition. She borrowed a book, one Ainakoji was looking for. Farewell My Lovely by Raymond Chandler. She would let him take it if he returned it for her. A fair trade, so our boy accepted. Ainakoji went to the library and ran into someone unexpected, Hiyori. She was struggling to reach a book, so Ainakoji helped her out. Hiyori recognized him and the book he was carrying is the same book she was looking for for weeks. Talk about coincidence. They talked about the book and how it was a pain to get a hold of. Turns out Hiyori is a major bookworm. However, Ainakoji was on guard. No way is this a mere coincidence. His only interaction with her is when she ambushed their study group. Ainakoji figured Ruin planted her to keep an eye on him. But to his surprise, Hiyori didn't seem all that worried. In fact, she was off in her little world talking about books. When she found out Ainakoji liked to read, she was excited. Finally, someone else who liked books. And right away, she started making recommendations. But Hiyori wasn't dumb. She noticed Ainakoji's hesitation and asked if she was bothering him. Ainakoji eased her by saying she wasn't bothering him, he was just caught off guard. Wanting to continue the conversation, Hiyori asked Ainakoji 
Koji to lunch. Was this part of the trap? Could be. But honestly, Hiri invited him because she wanted to. She had no friends in class C just like Aine Koji when he first arrived. Like him, she was bad at dealing with people. And Ruin kept her company out of pity. But since he was always surrounded, Hiori felt overwhelmed. In fact, Hiori surprised even herself by asking Aine Koji to lunch. She's never done anything like this. She was frank, admitting to Aine Koji no one in class C liked books. And she wanted to share her hobby with him. Aine Koji had no reason to refuse. Still, he didn't trust her. Honestly, Hiori was creepy to him. She was a key player inside class C, but he never noticed her in any exam. They went to the cafeteria and poor Hiori struggled to order food. This is the first time she was here and honestly, Aine Koji could sympathize. He knew the trouble of trying to fit into normal society. Also, when he helped her with her bag, it was heavy. Which made sense because later he found out it was full of books. The girl then started pulling out book after book recommending them. This was her personal collection. She legit lugged around a bunch of books hoping to meet someone who shared her taste. And to Hiyori's pleasant surprise, her and Aine Koji had similar taste in books. They both liked mystery. So she offered him a book by Ellery Queen and our boy took it. At this point, Aine Koji knew she wasn't a spy. Hiyori just wanted to hang out. He found it funny how such a simple coincidence could lead to a meeting like this. After class, Aine Koji received a message from Haruka that Aine Koji group was hanging out. This made him happy, but it would not last long. You see, Haruka had a hidden agenda. As soon as they met up, she hijacked the conversation. She playfully elbowed Aine Koji saying, you dog. What she was referring to was his date with Hiyori. However, Haruka was impressed. Most guys would be embarrassed, but Aine Koji was awfully calm. Haruka accidentally let slip the fact that Sakura was agonizing over this. Poor Sakura panicked. That was supposed to be a secret. Haruka couldn't help but tease Sakura. She was so precious. She admired the purity of Sakura's feelings. So she questioned our boy trying to figure out if there was something between him and Hiyori. It was all for Sakura's sake. She asked all the questions Sakura could not. Because you see, Sakura's heart was all over the place. First, Sato went after her crush and then Hiyori showed up. Aine Koji noticed what was going on and flat out denied being on a date with Hiyori. He even lied saying Hiyori was sent there to spy on him. Sakura was relieved but her heart was beating fast. Witnessing Aine Koji and Hiyori together, she couldn't get it out of her head. And if they start dating, she had no idea what she would do. Haruka pulled Sakura aside telling her to be more direct and to try harder. If she didn't, someone would steal Aine Koji away. Honestly, Haruka was okay with Sakura dating our boy. He seems like a good dude and she was afraid of a random dating Sakura because she pictured them all having bad intentions. But this negative outlook of boys was probably her own projection given all the negative attention she's received from boys her entire life. And it's not like Haruka couldn't relate. She also had guys she had crushes on but the problem, her standards were sky high. She always liked dudes who were unobtainable which naturally led her never to confessing. In class D, no one but maybe Hirata met her criteria. But recently she thought Aine Koji's not half bad. On the surface, he was nothing special but there was something about him. But Haruka quickly banished these thoughts. She liked this group and wanted to support Sakura's first love. She wouldn't ruin either of those things for the world. Their conversations again naturally led to class C. It was a hot topic. Given Ruin's persistence, the group thought, hey, maybe there is a mastermind. Someone who isn't Horikita. Yukimura had a gut feeling there was. Class D recovered too easily from a disastrous start. They thought maybe Koenji, but uh, dismiss that idea because he's never going to do anything sane. Hirata was a candidate and on Ruin's list. Hiyori let slip that fact back in volume 6. And out of nowhere, Sakura had the million dollar guess. She said it might be Aina Koji. But her theory was based more on feelings than logic. She said he was calm and smart and also gave Horikita a lot of advice. The others were curious but ultimately brushed it off. But Aina Koji knew one thing for sure. It was only a matter of time before Ruin strikes. And if Ruin wasn't putting enough pressure on him, the next day he had another visitor, Sato. But he did know that her short skirt was mesmerizing. Listen, no volume is complete without Horny Koji. I don't make the rules here. Sato was direct, inviting him on a date, acting all cutesy by playing with her hair. And from the distance, Aine Koji could feel Haruka's gaze pierce into his soul. If he accepts right now, he's never gonna hear the end of this. So Aine Koji denied Sato's request. However, the reason wasn't really Haruka. It was Sai. When Aine Koji was alone, Sai approached him and told him to follow. It was urgent. She brought him to the reception office, but something was off. She was nervous. He's never seen her like this. Sai knocked on the door and alerted the headmaster that Aine Koji was here. Aine Koji entered the room and met the 60-year-old headmaster. But just like Sai, that man was also sweating bullets. Something was up and Aine Koji realized there was only one explanation. A man sat in front of the headmaster. He was in his 40s. However, his aura commanded respect. The headmaster ran away, so it was just Aine Koji and that man in that room, alone. The man commanded Aine Koji to sit down. But Aine Koji wouldn't. He didn't plan to be here for long. 
because he had plans with friends after. The man scoffed at the idea of Ainokoji having friends. That's impossible. Our hero wasn't surprised. That man always acted like he knew everything. Regardless, Ainokoji informed him that talking here makes no difference. However, the man did not care. He knew he would get his way. He had the papers ready and all Ainokoji had to do was sign and then he'd drop out. Ainokoji was like, there's no reason for me to drop out. The man looked into Ainokoji's eyes. With one sharp gaze, he could stare into the core of your being. The man was Ainokoji's father, also known as Professor Ainokoji. But really, up till now, Ainokoji never recognized him as his dad. They were father and son only on paper. Professor Ainokoji ranted about how Ainokoji disregarded his orders. So to make amends, he should at least drop out. Ainokoji reminded the old man that his orders only hold true inside the white room. Ainokoji's dad was like, nah, Ainokoji was his property. He could do with them whatever he liked. Whether Ainokoji lived or died was up to him. Ainokoji's like, nope, I am not leaving the school. They're just going around in circles, so Professor Ainokoji tried something different. He brought up Matsuo, the butler who cared for Ainokoji before he came to the school. The same butler who told Ainokoji about the school and helped him enroll. A foolish idea, Professor Ainokoji remarked. Ainokoji remembered Matsuo well. He was a great caretaker. Matsuo always wanted children, but his wife and him couldn't conceive until he was 40. And tragically, during childbirth, his wife passed away. But he was blessed with a son, Eichiro. Matsuo would always talk about his son, Ainokoji remembered. He was the apple of his eye. And the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Eichiro was an outstanding individual, studying hard so he could pay his dad back for everything he's done. Unfortunately, Ainokoji wasn't the only one who knew about Eichiro, so did Professor Ainokoji. The professor reported Eichiro was doing well. Matsuo's son worked to the bone, getting accepted into a prestigious school. But in a cruel twist of fate, he was expelled. He didn't say it, but Ainokoji knew his dad got Matsuo's son expelled. Ainokoji knew full well he had the power to do so, and only if it stopped there. Eichiro tried his best. Setback after setback, the boy applied to different schools. And one after another, Professor Ainokoji got him expelled from all of them. He also made sure Matsuo's reputation was ruined so he couldn't get any employment. Ainokoji wondered if his dad came all the way here just to be petty. What a letdown. And as you might have guessed, the story did not have a happy ending. Matsuo begged Professor Ainokoji to leave his dear son alone. And as reparations left this world by burning himself alive, Ainokoji understood the horrid point of the story to make him feel guilty. As if this was all somehow his fault. If only you didn't disobey my orders, then they wouldn't have to suffer. Those were the words his dad implied. Professor Ainokoji reported now Matsuo's son could only get menial part-time jobs. All because of Ainokoji's selfish actions. Matsu must be cursing Ainokoji from his grave. Even though the situation was messed up, Ainokoji wouldn't bite. He countered saying all those horrible deeds were his dad's fault. And it's all the more reason for him to stay to honor Matsuo's will. Professor Ainokoji noticed a change in our boy. Before he would never defy him. Ainokoji admitted the white room wasn't all that bad. He received the best education a human being could get. Art, science, self-defense, martial arts. He learned them all. Questionable methods aside, it achieved results. You could argue it's the most efficient place to raise a human. Still, it did not satiate his curiosity. His dad rejected the outside world and Ainokoji yearned for it. Ainokoji wanted to know what true freedom was and you can't learn that in the white room. So Matsuo advised Ainokoji to come to this school, the only place in Japan his dad couldn't reach him. Professor Ainokoji threatened our boy saying he could get him expelled whenever he likes. But Ainokoji called his bluff saying he can't interfere with the school. The first clue was Ainokoji's dad didn't have his guards with him. Professor Ainokoji had guards accompany him everywhere. So the fact they're not here means he didn't have permission. Also, the school was backed by the government. So for his dad, this was enemy grounds. And the final piece of evidence? If Professor Ainokoji wanted him expelled, he didn't have to come here. All he'd have to do is snap his fingers and Ainokoji would be gone. Just like Matsuo's son. Professor Ainokoji asked our boy why even attend the school. Ainokoji was frank, curiosity, and the ability to decide his own path. Professor Ainokoji scoffed at the idea. The only path Ainokoji needed was the path set by him. Ainokoji would succeed him and lead Japan into the future. But to our boy, this was just a fairy tale. The ramblings of an old man. Professor Ainokoji informed our boy that the white room again was operational. No candidate from the white room so far has achieved the results Ainokoji has. He gave our boy an option. Leave the school or be forced out. And for the final time, Ainokoji responded, he's not going anywhere. Professor Ainokoji asked what joy he felt socializing with peasants. Low lives with no redeeming qualities. Ainokoji begged to differ. This school was a wonderful place. Here he could find out whether or not human beings were made equal. And now it all makes sense going back all the way to his monologue in volume 1. That was the first thing that came to his mind as he enrolled into the school. Ainokoji's dad asked if he was serious. Does he really think subhumans can rise to the level of genius? Our 
boy wholeheartedly wished for it to be true and he would find out. Maybe this is why Ainakoji loves witnessing growth inside of people. You see it all throughout the volumes. He helps Horikita grow, helps Sakura break out of her shell, saves Sudo from being in trouble. And trust me, you're gonna see the biggest example later in this volume. But suddenly their conversation was cut short. Another man entered the room. It was the newly appointed chairman, Sakayanagi. And if that name sounds familiar, it should because he's Arisu's dad. The chairman greeted them both he and Professor Ainakoji had history. But matter at hand, the chairman knew what was up. He said, sure, in some cases, parents may withdraw their children from the school. For example, in the case of bullying. But that isn't the case here and Ainakoji agreed. So if Ainakoji does not want to drop out, he does not have to. Now our boy understood why Matsuo sent him here. It was because of this chairman. This was the first time Ainakoji saw someone go toe to toe with his father without fear. Sakayanagi has changed too, Ainakoji's dad proclaimed. He used to be a yes man before. The chairman agreed to having great respect for Ainakoji's dad. But this school has a different vision. It hasn't changed over the years and it's not gonna change now. Ainakoji's dad asked why did he let his son enroll. The chairman said he qualified but Ainakoji's dad knew that was BS. At this school, entrance exams don't matter. In fact, the whole interview process is just for show. The chairman was impressed by Professor Ainakoji's intel. This school is special and works on a recommendation basis. Initially, Ainakoji wasn't recommended and they don't take kindly to late arrivals. So it's understandable why Ainakoji wouldn't make the cut. But the chairman took it upon himself to give Ainakoji a personal evaluation and he deemed him fit for the school. And as long as Ainakoji is enrolled at the school, he's under the school's protection. Professor Ainakoji had no more cards to play so he asked a different question. If Ainakoji is expelled according to the rules of this school, is that fine? The chairman agreed as long as it's according to the rules of the school. Ainakoji won't get special treatment. Professor Ainakoji was satisfied with that answer and would leave. But before he could, Ainakoji started joking saying maybe you should drop by more often if he intends to act like a parent. Ainakoji's dad was not amused. On the other hand, the chairman was like, that was rough. He's completely exhausted from dealing with Ainakoji's dad. But he did want to talk with our boy. He knew of him, but always from the other side of the glass. The chairman also admitted to being Arisu's father, but explained that's not why Arisu is in class A. She was there on her own merit. This also solved the mystery at the end of volume 5. How did Arisu know Ainakoji but he didn't know her? Is because she too has witnessed him from the other side of the glass. Ainakoji asked how enrollment in this school worked, and the chairman explained that they were admitted based on surveys. Everything else is a formality, so even if Ainakoji scored 0 on his exams, it wouldn't matter. His enrollment was all already guaranteed. This also explains Yukimura and Horikita's dilemma back in volume 1. They got perfect scores and interviews but were still placed in class D because those things don't matter. It also explained how dummies like the idiot trio got in along with students who had dark pasts like Hirata, Kei, and Kushida. The chairman assured him everything in the future will become apparent. How the school chooses students and how they nurture them. But at the moment this is all he can say. The only thing Ainakoji needed to know is as long as he's at the school his safety is guaranteed if he abides by the rules. Our boy left the office and Sai was waiting for him. She wanted to know how the talk went. But our boy knew what was up. Sai wanted intel. He wouldn't give her anything. Ainakoji confronted Sai. He knew she was feeding him lies all this time. Sai was shaken but did her best to put on an act. However, Ainakoji saw right through it. The way she talked, her body language was all off. Sai was nervous and he could smell it. Oh, how the tables have turned. Sai now realized she couldn't treat Ainakoji like a regular high school kid. Back in volume 3, Sai threatened Ainakoji. She told him his dad was trying to get in contact with him. And if he didn't cooperate to try to get to class A, she would let him get expelled. But after today's meeting, Ainakoji knew those were all lies. This was the first time his dad has set foot in the school. And though he didn't have proof, he knew Sai had no contact with him. Ainakoji used the same trick on Sai that he did on Masumi. He bluffed. Our boy said the chairman told him everything about how Sai was informed about Ainakoji's special circumstances when he enrolled. Sai was blindsided. She didn't think the chairman would let that slip. She repeated back the phrase in disbelief. But that was a mistake. Ainakoji let out a sinister laugh. His suspicions were true. Sai tried to compose herself but it was too late. Ainakoji tricked her. The chairman mentioned nothing about her. But now Ainakoji had the final piece of the puzzle. He explained what he knew. The event started right when he applied to the school. The chairman, knowing his circumstances, got him enrolled. The chairman also made sure he was enrolled to class D. Why? Because Sai was known to be a teacher with zero ambition. So in her class, Ainakoji could lay low. But the chairman miscalculated
isolated. He had no idea Sai secretly wanted to reach class A. Sai stood there listening to Aldous, unable to say a word. She realized how gravely she underestimated Ainokoji. She's seen talented students before, but nothing like this. But Ainokoji's abuse wasn't over. This was payback. Sai had no more leverage. He could be as cruel as he wanted. So he let it all out. The only reason Sai never showed her ambition was due to circumstances. The students she got were always dead weight, so she pretended not to care. But when Ainokoji arrived, she found her golden ticket, combined with the current lineup, Horikita, Hirata, Kushida, Koenji. Though their personalities sucked, they were capable. This gave Sai hope. The ambition she locked away burned bright. So Sai jumped on this once in a lifetime opportunity. That's why she called in Ainokoji and Horikita back in volume 1. To judge the situation, Horikita was just an excuse to get to Ainokoji. But things didn't go as expected. Ainokoji had no ambition to try hard. So when it came time for the island exam, Sai panicked. She knew if class D didn't recover now, they never would. Using the information she got from the chairman, she made a desperate move, which was pretending Ainokoji's dad reached out to her. She used this bluff to borrow Ainokoji's abilities. And at the time, Ainokoji had no idea of knowing whether or not this was a bluff. So he did what he had to. Things stabilized and class D wasn't annihilated. But after the confrontation today, Sai lost all her cards. Sai just stood there while our boy dished it out. She finally admitted to not knowing Ainokoji's father. However, she still had one threat left. She could still have him expelled. The reason would change, but the outcome would still be the same. But Ainokoji knew he had her by the throat. She won't expel him. Sai so was like, how are you so sure? Ainokoji explained, right now, class D was doing better than ever. Horikita could actually lead them to class A. So if anyone gets expelled, including Ainokoji, that would be a disaster. At this point, Sai just stopped walking. She was thinking, thinking of a way, any way to get Ainokoji back under her control. No matter the method, she needed his abilities. If she cleared this hurdle, getting to class A was possible, allowing her to make peace with her past and strip away the darkness eating away at her heart. But for the moment, our boy was free. He no longer had to try to reach class A. He could live a normal life. He told Sai for the moment, his turn was up. And if she doesn't back off, he'll personally make sure they never reach class A. Sai asks, what if she goes kamikaze and decides to expel him anyways? Ainokoji's like, sure, if she ever gets to a hopeless spot, she's free to do it. But she should remember, her spot as a teacher isn't rock solid either. This was an empty threat, but given Sai's emotional state right now, she couldn't take it lightly. Sai had nothing else to say and Ainokoji took his leave. The meeting with his father sucked, but at least he got something. Ruin could do whatever he liked. It didn't concern our boy. If something happens to Kei, well, that's her problem. Even if Kei gives up his identity, it doesn't matter. If he steps down and does nothing, Ruin will eventually get bored. Ainokoji decided to go back to the dorms. He looked up as his breath fogged up the air. It was cold. Last time this year, he was indoors, so he couldn't experience the change in seasons. Remember how I said change would be a major theme? Well, this is our first real example. For the first time ever, Ainokoji felt real freedom. Freedom from his dad. Freedom from Sai. Freedom from doing things he didn't want to. Enjoying his new life, Ainokoji noticed a girl. She was so loud on the phone, he could listen in. The girl was talking to Nagumo. Turns out the new student council president was quite the player. He was making a pass at her. Ainokoji, being a man of unparalleled intelligence, paid attention to the most important matter at hand, the girl's ties. I promise, I'm not even trying to be funny at this point. It's literally in the book. He noticed they were exposed to the cold and wondered how uncomfortable that was. As she walked by, our boy got a whiff of her shampoo. It was intoxicating. While the girl wasn't introduced, her name was Nazuna. And listening in, Ainokoji learned two things. The girl was a second year and Nagumo wanted her to be part of the council. There was also mention of a competition between Nagumo and Manabu. The girl said she would consider Nagumo's invitation if he won. But after hanging up, the girl commented Nagumo would definitely triumph over Manabu. Ainokoji followed the girl as they were going the same way. However, out of nowhere, she slipped and fell. She turned around, noticing our hero and flashing him an embarrassed smile before getting right out of there. Ainokoji didn't think much of the incident but noticed a fork in the road. One led to the first year dorms and the other to the second year. For a while, Ainokoji just stood there thinking because like the road in front of him, Ainokoji's future was divided. Ainokoji wondered if he experienced snow for the first time, would he enjoy it? Would he be excited? Would he be happy? Now, if you take these details at face value, it just sounds like a random detail. But when you read between the lines, it gets interesting. In Japanese art and literature, snow 
often symbolizes purity and innocence. And given the context of her story here, snow means a little bit more than just the weather. It represents Ainikoji's desire to have an innocent high school life. Ever since Ainikoji was born, he's been part of the white room. He's worked to the bone to be molded into the perfect human being. But at what cost? At the cost of his freedom, at the cost of his innocence, his chance to ever live a normal life. That's why he mentions snow at this crucial moment, because right now he has a chance to reclaim what he was denied his entire life. So far, he's kept a low profile manipulating things behind the scenes. But the more Class D wins, the more attention they get. Using Horikita as a cover starts to lose meaning. Ruin saw right through it and Arisu also knows about his past. And Ichinose is watching him so it's only a matter of time. If Ainikoji wanted to pull back, now was it. But he wouldn't make a reckless decision just yet. Right now, the only immediate concern was Ruin. And to be rid of him, Ainikoji knew what to do. Ainikoji called Kei and after a bit, she picked up. Kei had no idea Ruin marked her and the danger that awaited. Ainikoji asked her what she was up to. But immediately, Kei responded, is he joking? Because he only contacts her when he needs something. Ainikoji's like, what, you don't enjoy our casual conversations? Kei was like, it's hard to enjoy them when she knew he didn't enjoy them either. Ainikoji had to agree. Our boy got down to business asking Kei if Manabe and her friends contacted her. Ainikoji speculated since it's been so long since the incidents, the threat is likely gone. Kei hoped he was right, but you never know. Ainikoji knew given Kei's trauma, she wouldn't feel safe until graduation. Kei heard the wind on the other side of the phone and asked if Ainikoji was still outside. Ainikoji's like, yeah, but he's heading back now. On the way, Ainikoji noticed something. The girl who fell earlier dropped an amulet. Ainikoji picked it up and would return it to the dorm admins. Given the pause, Kei switched topics. She asked Ainikoji why he kept his talents hidden. Class D was full of idiots so he could easily take charge. Ainikoji tried playing it off by saying he wasn't smart, but they both knew that was a lie. Ainikoji stopped the boys from peeping. He kept Kushida in check during paper shuffle. Fended off Ruin during the sports festival. Kei speculated that if our boy stepped up, he'd be popular. Ainikoji pointed out the obvious, he's not interested. Kei then brought up a good point, why try in the first place? He should have kept quiet from the start. Well, initially that was the plan. Kei had no idea Sai blackmailed him. And our boy was in a good mood, so he told her a bit more. He explained from the start he had no intention of helping out. But a reason came up and it forced his hand. Kei still felt it was a waste. However, Ainikoji reiterated that he never wanted to help. He needed Kei to understand that moving forward, he wasn't helping Class D. So if there's a problem, she shouldn't come to him. And he knew Kei had a tendency to do so. When everything fell apart during the sports festival, Kei kept coming to him for help. Kei then brought up the topic of Ruin and the mastermind he's looking for. Kei knew that mastermind was our boy. The rumors that Ruin was looking spread throughout the entire school. But on to the main topic, Ainikoji had made his decision. He apologized to Kei. Kei was confused. Why is he apologizing? Ainikoji explained before he had a reason to help Class D, but that doesn't exist anymore. He'll leave Class D in the hands of Hirata and Horikita. He thanked Kei for all her help and apologized for all the trouble. Kei asked if she was finally free and Ainikoji's like, yup, this is the last time he'll be contacting her like this. Wait, Kei was caught off guard. She thought it just meant she wouldn't have to do anything for him anymore. Not that he'd cut off their relationship. Making an excuse, she said she couldn't hear him. But Ainikoji knew fully well she did. So he said it again. This is the last time I'll contact you. He explained it was natural. He's not helping Class D, so he doesn't need her help. So they don't need to talk. Their relationship was always one of mutual benefit. No one else knows about their conversations. If they kept talking, it could risk Ainikoji being found out. Kei couldn't refute anything. It all made sense. Ainikoji assured her though, if she's ever in trouble, he'll still save her. He gave her an emergency contact, but she should erase all traces of them talking on the phone. He's already deleted everything on his end. This was extra cruel and I'll tell you why. He's basically saying he deleted the birthday message she sent him. Damn. Ainikoji asked why shouldn't he do any of this. Kei complained softly. It was cold, even for him. Ainikoji disagreed. This was always their relationship. They had a twisted bond from the beginning. Otherwise, they wouldn't match. He's gloomy and she's popular. They are not the same. Ainikoji asked her, did she hate being used? Kei on the surface had to agree, but she wanted to say more. She just couldn't find the words. And her silences grew longer and longer. Finally, Ainikoji decided to end it. He said everything he wanted to. He asked Kei if she wanted to add anything else. But she couldn't muster anything more than whispering, all right. Ainikoji knew Kei didn't want this, but it's not like she could do anything. Kei found the resolve to ask one last question. She asked if this was the last time they could talk like this. Ainikoji asked if she hated that. Kei put on a strong persona and instinctively said no, she did not hate it. Then Ainikoji's like, no problem. Ainikoji did not show a hint of emotion. It had no place here. He said he would end the call. And as he did, shared his final words. See you. Kei was about to say something, but couldn't. Ainikoji let the call run for a bit and then ended it. He then deleted the call history. Ainikoji knew Kei relied on him for peace. It was her parasitic nature.
picture. But now Ainokuji ripped away that reliance. The feelings battling inside her must be intense. Her loneliness and anxiety will slowly build. And if Ruin were to target her, she would surely collapse. I want you to bookmark this conversation for the second half of the volume. Because it changes the entire story. Ainokuji retired back to his room and got to cleaning. New Year knew him. He wanted everything spotless. Ainokuji readied some tea and took out his phone. He contemplated his next move. Thinking back, he didn't inherently hate the white room. Sure, it's not winning any prizes for human rights, but it gave him an unmatched education. He was 16 but had more knowledge than a human can accumulate in a lifetime. It also shaped his personality while supplying him with a skill set that made life easy. But at what cost? He was hailed as a masterpiece. The perfect human. Should that make him happy? It did not. Ainakuji derived joy from learning. He's always asking questions, always wanting to know about people's personalities. Curiosity was his bread and butter. That's why he enjoyed reading books. That's why he left the white room. That environment couldn't satisfy him. He always suspected Sai didn't know his father because the idea of a mere school teacher stopping his dad was a tall order. But without proof, he couldn't ignore her threat. He had no choice but to take her at her word. However, that didn't matter anymore. Even if Arisu and Ichinose took an interest in him, if he stopped doing stuff, they would go away. The only problem was ruined. His nature was obsessive. Ainakoji wanted to keep his identity hidden, but that wasn't possible. There was an invisible thread binding him to K, a thread Ruin would find. It could be a day, a week, it didn't matter how long, he would find it eventually. Our boy found that suspense annoying. Suddenly, Ainakoji had a visitor. The man knocked on Ainakoji's door and was swiftly let in. They couldn't afford to be seen together. That man was Manabu. He had business with our boy. Manabu cut right to the chase. His time at the school was almost up. He had two months left and he came here to inform Ainakoji about Nagumo. Our boy wondered what for. Ainakoji is a random first year. This is way above his pay grade. Manabu admitted he didn't want to tell anyone about this. But circumstances have changed. Nagumo wanted to change the school. We saw this at the beginning of volume 6. And he's keeping that promise. As you saw earlier, he tried to recruit Nazuna into the student council. Manabu warned starting next year, there are going to be a lot of expulsions. Ainakoji countered saying, didn't Manabu recruit Nagumo? Manabu did. And his biggest regret was failing to train his successor. Nagumo held different ideas and already conquered the school. Two first years applied this year to the student council, Katsuragi and Ichinose. Both of them are talented and Manabu rejected them both. He didn't want them to fall into Nagumo's hands. But Nagumo went behind his back to recruit Ichinose. Ainakoji asked what the point of this visit was. Simple, Manabu wanted Ainakoji to keep Nagumo in check. Manabu was fine with Ainakoji using Horikata as a cover. The former student council even offered to be a bridge between Ainakoji and the council. This was a huge ask, meaning Manabu must be desperate. However, Ainakoji didn't seem interested, so Manabu wouldn't push forward. But before Manabu could leave, Ainakoji surprisingly called out to him. Our boy asked Manabu for his contact information. He said he'd give it some thought. Manabu obliged, but said he wouldn't hold out any expectations. Next day, snow fell, but Ainakoji missed the spectacle. Today, Ainakoji was hanging out with his group. They got coffee, went shopping. They even played this fun game at karaoke where you order a plate of takoyaki, but one of them is extra spicy. And if you pick that one, you have to sing a song without drinking any water. Now, that's just evil. Funny enough, Yukimura kept getting the spicy takoyaki. Dude got it like five times in a row. Ainakoji calculated the odds of that were 1 in 7,776. Regardless, the gang had a blast. This is the blissful school life Ainakoji dreamed of. But on the way back, the group ran into an unusual pair. Ichinose and Arisu were hanging out. Noticing Ainakoji, Ichinose immediately waved him over. Ichinose commented on how this was a weird group for him. Right back at ya. The leader of class A and class B casually hanging out? That's not strange at all. But as we know from the previous volume, this is Arisu making her move on class B. She asked Ichinose to quote unquote consult her on a mysterious topic. Ichinose congratulated their group for beating class C. With this starting the new term, class D would become class C. Ichinose joked that they might be coming for her next. But Yukimura took this seriously saying that they would overtake her and even beat class A and Arisu just chuckled. This is like an Abra trying to take on a Mewtwo bro. It ain't gonna work. Unfortunately, the Ainakoji group was full of loners and outcasts. So they didn't vibe with Ichinose's bubbly personality. Ichinose noticed this and politely excused herself. Arisu too just nodded and left. Arisu wasn't dumb enough to give Ainakoji any clues about what she's doing. But after they left, the Ainakoji group started discussing amongst themselves. The two of them hanging out wasn't odd because Ichinose got along with everyone. However, Haruka didn't like Ichinose. She seemed 
too perfect. If a person doesn't have a flower too, it's unrealistic. Haruka hoped secretly Ichinose was rotten inside. Sakura, however, wanted the opposite. She was hoping Ichinose is as she seems. This might also be influenced by that incident back in volume 2 where Ichinose also came to save Sakura. But they all agreed fighting someone like Ichinose is a challenge. Fighting Ruin wasn't a big deal. The dude inspired hatred. But Ichinose is a different story. Some students in class D might hold back because they like her. And what about the alliance between her and Horikita? Things could get rough. And speaking of rough, a few days after class D was met with chaos, the door swung wide open and Ruin and his goons marched in. Everyone's like, what the hell's going on? Sai looked at them once and left. After Ainakoji's verbal beating, she's been tame. Now, if Ruin and his lackeys did anything, it would be a different story. But they pretended to be visiting the class, which isn't illegal. Ainakoji speculated this was Ruin's move to pressure him. Sudo was the first to approach Ruin and Hirata panicked. He did not want a repeat of volume 2. Hirata politely asked Ruin if he had any business with them. Ruin just laughed, saying he's here to pay them a friendly visit. Hirata tried to de-escalate, but Ruin would not budge. He started taunting them, saying how nice. They'll become class C next semester. But Ruin soon revealed why he was here. He addressed all of class D, issuing a warning. A warning meant for X. Hirata asked what that was about. Have a Ruin counter saying, do you not get it or are you pretending not to get it? Despite all the chaos, one student just followed his daily routine. The mad lad got up and left. It was Koenji. As Koenji entered the hallway, Ruin and his goons followed. Once Ruin's men left, there was an uproar. They worried Ruin would do something to Koenji. Interestingly enough, Kushida stayed out of this. After her loss in volume 6, she laid low. Horikita and Ainikoji knew Ruin had the wrong target, but Miyaki wanted to go check it out. Yukimir also tagged along strength in numbers. And when Hirata wanted to come, Ainikoji stopped him, saying he should stay back. He's best suited to calming the class. So it was Miyaki, Yukimura, Ainikoji, Horikita, and Sudo on this mission. Someone told them that Koenji usually returns to his dorm. And they were right, they saw Ruin's goons corner Koenji on the way. It made sense Ruin would want to be out in the open with no cameras. The class D students observed as Ruin asked Koenji to come play with him. But Koenji is just like, who are you peasants? He did not remember grabbing their attention. Ruin said that's not for him to decide. Outnumbered or not, Koenji did not care. Saying it's not for Ruin to decide either. Ruin asked Koenji if he remembered him. Koenji's like, sure, your class C's delinquent Kun. Ruin's like, that's right, freak, and he would accompany him today. But the golden-haired beauty respectfully declined Ruin's advances. Ruin wasn't his type. The freak comment, however, did bug him. But Koenji, being the benevolent being that he is, let it slide. Also, Koenji had a date with a beautiful girl, so he must depart soon. Ruin, however, informed him that he's not going anywhere. Since this would take a while, they moved to the side of the road. The class D students also followed. Horikita immediately called out to Ruin, but she fell for his trap. His plan was to use Koenji as bait to see who would show up. This let him narrow down his suspects for X. Interestingly enough, Ruin asked where Hirata was. Ruin joked that the guy was practically the beacon of justice, so it wouldn't be strange for him to be here. Now, do you think Ruin cares about a random student from class D, let alone enough to comment on it? I don't think so. The reason Ruin is aware of Hirata is because Hirata is his prime candidate for X. Why? I'm about to tell you by diving into the first secret plot of volume 7. And like always, this is just speculation. This plot goes back as far as volume 4. The first time Ruin learned of X's existence was back in volume 5, when Anikoji sent Ruin that video showing that he targeted Horikita during the sports festival. From that moment, Ruin understood one thing. X is someone who hides in the shadow and uses pawns to do his bidding. And this idea was enhanced when he found out X used K during volume 6. You know, when he got K to pour that drink all over Kushida. But why lean towards Hirata and not Ainakoji? It's because Ainakoji set up events to make himself look like a pawn. The first time Ruin witnessed this is when Ainakoji raced seriously against Manabu. He generated a lot of attention. X would never do that. So it looked like someone was using Ainakoji as a pawn. And that's the reason Ruin suspected Hirata as early as volume 5. Remember when Ruin was trying to get Horikita to kneel? When he received the video from X, Kushida said Ainakoji might be a candidate. But Ruin brushed it off saying he's not the only candidate, Hirata is as well. In volume 6, Ruin's suspicion of Hirata intensified. He hunted the spy within his class, Manabe. Manabe told him about all the events that transpired and how Ainakoji and Yukimura arrived to save K. Do you see a pattern here? Again, Ainakoji showed up to the scene. Ruin knows X is someone who doesn't do his dirty work. Okay, so far it looks like Ainakoji is a pawn, but 
why would Hirata be controlling him and not anyone else? It makes sense because Manabe told Ruin about the details of K's past. So for anyone to be ex, they would have to be close to K. And as we know, Ayane Koji is thinking a hundred steps ahead. That's why he always made sure his relationship with K was hidden. No one knew they were close, including Ruin. So the only person capable of filling that role was Hirata. On the surface, he was K's boyfriend. And we know that because in volume 6, Ruin referred to K as Hirata's girl. No one knows they had a fake relationship. Also, Ayane Koji deliberately shaped all his interactions with Ruin to make it look like he was a pawn by repeatedly making himself look boring. Here are a few key events. Back in volume 4, when Ayane Koji and Horikita found that Ruin was recording them, they set up the scenario to make it look like Ayane Koji knew nothing. In volume 5, Ruin asked Ayane Koji if Horikita and Suda were doing it behind the scenes. Again, our boy gave him a boring response. And you know very well what happened in volume 6. All the way from when Ruin spotted them trying to hand in their questions to when Horikita was pulling off her epic move. Ayane Koji acted like he knew nothing and was a normal student. Ruin tested our boy time and time again with information that would only catch X off guard and he deflected everything, giving Ruin a consistent image of our boy being nothing more than a pawn. So by meticulously moving all these pieces into place, Aine Koji painted an image for Ruin. He planted an idea, the idea that Hirata is the mastermind. When the Class C girls attacked K, he sent Aine Koji to go snap a picture. In the sports festival, he ordered Aine Koji to race Manabu. Now, you might be thinking one thing doesn't make sense. X deliberately leaked K's past and got her bullied by the Class C girls. But if X is Hirata and K's boyfriend, could he stomach doing that to his girlfriend, Ruin knew he could because there was a similar case before. Remember, X and Horikita were close. And back in volume 6, Ruin figured out something interesting. X let Ruin deliberately torment Horikita during the sports festival. He let her get messed up over and over again. So it wouldn't be a stretch to say he could do the same thing to K. And the cherry on top? Aine Koji is still painting that same image. Even in this volume. Before coming here, what did Aine Koji tell Hirata? He told him to stay back and handle the class. Again, this painting the same picture for Ruin. It makes it look like Hirata sent Aine Koji to scout out the events in his place. Yeah, Ruin used Koenji to narrow down the suspects for X. To everyone, it looks like Ruin is paying an attention to those who showed up. But in reality, Ruin was paying closer attention to those who didn't. And right now, Hirata looks like a mastermind using his pawn. But back to the story, Ruin still wanted to play with Koenji. He ordered his goons to surround him. Koenji didn't mind playing around, but told Ruin, hey, since I've served my purpose, I can go now, right? However, Ruin was a done yet and Koenji would be today's star. Apparently Koenji owed him one. Koenji was curious as to how and Ruin brought the zodiac exam. Koenji successfully guessed the VIP of the monkey group which stole those points away from Ruin because Ruin already cracked the code and knew who the VIP was. Both Koenji and Ainikoji were impressed he knew that and Koenji said sorry in the least sorry way possible. And then Koenji started adjusting his hair a task of unparalleled importance. In fact he made Ruin hold his mirror while Koenji Koenji styled his hair, all the while surrounded by Ruin's lackeys. No Fs given, bro. Ruin just stood there with a smile on his face. And then boom, shattered Koenji's mirror on the ground. Then Ruin leaned forward and grabbed Koenji's arm. Figuring how long he could keep up this freak show, Koenji just let out a sigh saying that was quite expensive, you know? And Ruin was like, oops, my hand slipped. At this point, Horikita intervened, telling Ruin to knock it off. And if this day couldn't get any weirder, we had another addition. Arisu and her lackeys showed up. The crowd was now 15 people. Arisu stated this was mere coincidence, but Ruin knew better. But Arisu promised she would not interfere. As much as Koenji enjoyed the crowd, he wanted to leave. And the only way to do so was to give Ruin what he wanted. So he asked Ruin, you're looking for the mastermind, no? This was a huge leap for Koenji. He barely notices people's existence, let alone what they want. Koenji corrected Ruin. If so, he's got the wrong guy. Koenji wasn't interested in Class D and has done nothing noteworthy. Ruin countered saying then explain the Zodiac exam. Koenji was frank. He was bored and wanted to chill by the pool. So he ended it early. Ruin speculated maybe Koenji is working behind the scenes. Koenji was like sure, but if he actually believed that, he was a moron. Ishizaki wanted to step in and fight, but Ruin held him back. Ruin agreed if Koenji is telling the truth, he's harmless. Koenji was like, finally you get it, Dragon Boy. And there it was, Ruin's famous nickname. By the way, it wasn't random. The Ryu in Ruin's name actually means dragon. Arisu broke out laughing. She really liked that nickname.
same. But Ruin wasn't having fun. Ruin asked what if he got his goons to beat up Koenji right here, right now. Koenji was honest, he just pummeled him without issue. Ruin asked if he could really do that. Koenji couldn't imagine why he couldn't. Ruin humored Koenji then saying who do you think is the mastermind? For the first time today Koenji looked at the class D students. He didn't mind answering. But before he could answer, Arisu interrupted him. She had her own thoughts on the matter. She asked if the fact Ruin was looking for a mastermind within class D actually true. Now we all know this question is pure BS. The rumor by now had spread like wildfire throughout the school and Arisu having her eyes and ears everywhere just like Masumi tailing Ainokoji? There's no way she didn't know. After reading this over and over again there's only one explanation I can come to. She genuinely believed Koenji knew about Ainokoji and we know Arisu wants to keep Ainokoji for herself to defeat. You could figure that out when she confronted Ainokoji back in volume 5. So she has an interest in keeping Ainokoji's secret a secret. Even from Ruin. Also I think she likes messing around with Ruin too so that's an added bonus. And she knew how to divert Ruin's attention. She pressed on a mastermind within class D. How fascinating. Arisu also made sure to use the nickname Dragon Boy over and over again because it amused her and pissed off Ruin. And her taunts work. Ruin's attention was on her. Ruin threatened Arisu, use that nickname again and I'll kill you. Arisu apologized and then lied through her teeth, saying none of this made any sense. Arisu asked why is Ruin messing around with an unrelated person like Koenji? And she thought if there was a person pulling the strings behind Class D, they must be amazing. The ability to pull off plans without being noticed is quite the feat. Dragon Boy however pointed out this was part of his plan to find the mastermind. Arisu was like if that's the case that's even stupider. Arisu knew about Ruin's plan on the island and how it was demolished. And if Ruin did his research he should know Koenji retired during that exam. So how would he do anything? Arisu wondered if the mastermind even existed. Again of course she knew it existed and she knew Ainokoji was the mastermind. But her hypothesis painted a different picture. A scenario where there is no mastermind and Ruin just made it up. To hide his own incompetence. This was brutal because if Ruin wants to deny this train of thought he'll need proof. And the only proof available was the mastermind blackmailing Manabe and her friends. Which he obviously can't disclose. But if he agrees with Arisu he loses control over the entire situation and shows that he is incompetent. I doubt his ego could take that blow. However Ruin chose a different plan of action. Instead of playing her game he changed the topic. Out of nowhere he revealed the fact that he conned Katsuragi into a deal. Ruin wanted to flip the script and put Arisu in the same situation. She either leaves or volunteers crucial information about her class. But Arisu did not care. In fact she literally laid out the terms of the contract. To jog your memory every class on the island exam was given 300 points. They could use it to buy necessities. The leftovers would be added as class points. Katsuragi made a deal with Ruin. Class C would use their points to buy all the necessities for class A. This gave class A a huge boost in class points. But in exchange every person in class A would pay 20,000 private points every Every month to class C until graduation. Sudo was pissed this meant class C had a guaranteed allowance. However Horikita corrected him if you look closely it's an equal trade. The amount of points class A saved would earn back the amount of points they lost given the contract. Remember class points dictate your allowance per month. Ainokoji speculated if Katsuragi didn't make that deal class B might have caught up to them. But why would Arisu reveal all this? Ruin also wondered because revealing all this doesn't hurt him. If anything it hurts class A. He's not the one losing points per month and it's true if you you added up it's 800,000 private points flowing every month from class A to class C. That's no joke. It also gives Ruin insane leverage. Even if he decimates his class points he's guaranteed private points every month. But Arisu looked unfazed. She explained Ruin could also leak that info whenever he liked and by leaking it herself she took away that option from him. Besides she wasn't on the island she didn't make that deal it was Katsuragi. So if anyone's reputation takes a hit it'll be his. Man you gotta love how Arisu outplays Ruin at every turn effortlessly. And this was true, Ainokoji noticed Arisu was now the sole leader of class A. All of this was quite exciting but Koenji could care less, he wanted to go. Ruin was like nah before you give me the answer, who's the mastermind in class D? Koenji said he didn't give the matter any thought and even if he did, he wouldn't tell him. It looks like Ruin quite enjoys chasing the mastermind and Koenji being the ever so gracious being that he is, why would he rob Dragon Boy of that joy? Unthinkable. The only reason Koenji is at the school is to enjoy beautiful girls and bask 
in his own glow. At no point did the interclass conflict excite him, and everyone here bored him to no end. Ishizaki again wanted to fight Koenji, but was again interrupted, and not by Ruin, by Arisu. She did not like being called boring. She was like, Dragon Boy is one thing, but me being boring? But before she could finish that sentence, violence erupted. Ruin launched a kick right at Arisu's face. Luckily, Hashimoto got in the way and blocked that kick, but he was sent flying. Damn, Ruin almost kicked a lolly. That's gotta be illegal somewhere. Arisu asked if she hit a nerve, and Ruin reminded her, if she calls him that again, he'll kill her. Horikita intervened trying to get everyone to cool down, but there was no issue. Arisu would just sweep everything under the rug. She asked Hashimoto, the dude that was sent flying, if there was a problem, and Hashimoto was like, nah, I just slipped and fell. Remember, there are no cameras here, so whatever goes down, it doesn't matter unless someone reports it. At this point, Horikita realized they were both insane. Gee, what was your first clue? Back to the matter at hand, Arisu asked how would she ever be boring? Looks like Miss Brainiac isn't the only one who hit a nerve. Koenji's like, aw, what's that? You didn't like my comment, little girl? You could literally see the veins pop on Arisu's face. What a wonderful nickname, she explained, smiling menacingly. But she corrected Koenji, he was mistaken. Little girl is usually used to describe elementary kids. He was using the word wrong. Koenji corrected her. He was using it right. The comment wasn't about Arisu's age, it was about her body. Damn, son, Koenji's a monster. Arisu's lackeys wanted to fight him, but Koenji's like, I don't have business with you peasants. And everyone's just sitting there, watching Koenji clown on both the leaders of class A and class C. Ainakoji was mistaken. Back in volume 6, he deduced there were two types of powerful weapons, violence and lies. But after Koenji's supreme display of talent, he had to add insanity to that list. And funny enough, Ruin has had enough. He told Koenji to get lost, and Koenji magically galloped into the sunset. With that, Arisu also lost her interest and left. However, Ruin levied a threat. Coming the next semester, Arisu should watch her back. Arisu's like, sure, if he can defeat Class D, she'll gladly be his opponent. One of Ruin's goons asked if it was okay to let Koenji go. And Ruin was like, yeah, he's not X. X and Ruin think alike. Koenji's thought patterns were in a different galaxy. Regardless, Ruin was like, he'll soon end everything. No one from Class D bothered deciphering what that meant, but I, Nikoji, knew exactly what was coming. And you guys know what's happening next time. So leave a like and subscribe if you don't want to miss that notification. Thank you for watching and I'll see you guys then.